I've had a lot of teachers, but none of them have been a hologram. But that may be changing soon. I'm meeting with Dr. Roger Ezevedo. He's a professor and laboratory director at the UCF School of Modeling, Simulation and Training. I'm visiting him at the Smart Labs to discover the importance of simulation in research and career development. Tell me about yourself in School of Modeling, Simulation and Training. So my name is Roger Azevedo. I'm a professor at UCF in the School of Modeling, Simulation and Training. I'm a psychologist by training and I study human machine interactions across STEM and biomedical sciences. And I've been here for five years. Uh, I am a, as I mentioned, full professor in the School of Modeling, Simulation and Training. Our school is actually celebrating its 40th anniversary. Uh, this year and so here we are known for our work on modeling and simulation across different fields so mostly from the military, healthcare, K-12, STEM, transportation, uh, aerospace, avionics and the core work that is done here is by psychologists, computer science uh, scientists and engineers and then we also work with the different stakeholders depending if they are K-12 teachers, they could be military personnel, they could be physicians and nurses and other folks. Why is it important for the community to know what you do here? It is important for a community to know what we do here because a lot of our work is applied, even though we do basic science work, um, but most of our work is applied. So we take societal challenges such as uh, healthcare, uh, patient outcomes, criminology, cybersecurity, K-12 education, academic achievement, STEM pipeline and so what we do is we take uh, the real world problems and then we bring them back here and work with our stakeholders to figure out if we can come up with solutions. Most of the solutions that we develop are based on technology so whether we are building game-based learning environments to teach a kid for example or students to learn about the human circulatory system to teaching people not to fall prey to cybersecurity uh, and transgressions if you will whether they're military or somebody who's elderly and more probably more vulnerable and then also, for example, another example would be in terms of clinical aspects. So can we accelerate the learning of clinicians in terms of their clinical skills using modeling and simulation environments, such as holographic simulations that we're currently engaged in right now. And then at the same time, focusing on patient outcomes. So there's always some kind of societal challenge that we are trying to address. What's the latest project that you're working on? Yeah, so one of the latest projects we're working on with our interdisciplinary researchers and clinicians is a focus on human digital twins. So we are envious that an engineer, for example, can have a digital twin of a car, of a motor. So why can't we have a human digital twin? So imagine a human digital twin of yourself. So imagine being a 10th grade student, you're working on your physics problem, it's 10 o'clock at night, your teachers are not there, you're not in class, you don't have your peers, and your parents can't help you. Now imagine jumping into a virtual environment where you have a human digital twin of yourself. And of course you have to go to bed because we have our biological constraints. But imagine showing or telling this human digital twin of yourself that you know you need to work on these physics problems. While you sleep, it goes and learns all it can. Can then they come back and actually teach you who you are, right? And what you need to do to solve these problems. And can it be a companion that could serve many purposes? One of them, of course, is to teach and enhance your academic learning. What are applications of this that we see are, for example, um, the future of um, longevity. So let's say now you're 110 years old. You've lost your spouse, your family, you're living alone. You probably have artificial limbs. You have a, a human digital twin that now lives in your smart wall at home. So inside of our walls now can hear, feel, and think. And so this thing reminds you to you know, do your exercises. It can help you with memory issues. But and at the same time, it can also uh, relive the digitized memories that you had. So reliving your wedding day, reliving the birth of your child. Uh, so there's some components to this. And so the question is, what is the purpose of having this human digital twin in the future? Yeah, well, the first example I can see is a bunch of cheating. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yes. I don't feel like going to school today. Can you go? Mm -hmm. yep. Yep. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and the second one, mm -hmm. um, I don't know if even myself can convince me to exercise more. <laughs> yeah, so what I didn't get to is imagine how you have sensors, you had a hip replacement, you have sensors in your hip, and we can detect through learning analytics or health analytics that you're not doing your exercises. So the human digital twin is reminding you that if you don't do the medical regimen, then you're going to end up on the operating table again, and you want to go through that pain. So kind of thinking about uh, preventative medicine, mm -hmm. right, if that would help. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the whole concept of having digital memories. Can you imagine, you know, it's almost like the metaverse, mm -hmm. right? Can you, you know, how far can we push it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So how would you get the person's memories into the digital version? So one approach could be what uh, our colleagues in the College of Health Professions and Sciences are doing across the street, Dr. Barry Hoffman. Uh, so there's a holographic imaging. So imagine capturing people's stories like they've done with the Holocaust uh, survivors. Uh, and then we can store those memories, right? And then the question becomes, uh, can they be accessible at any time that you want to, right? The other thing is, so those are captured, right? So those are static and they can be played any time. But the question is, can now infuse artificial intelligence? So now, for example, let's take that to the next step. So imagine you have been diagnosed as pre-diabetic, right? You're a young adult, pre-diagnosed as pre-diabetic, right? Now you have a window of time in which you can change your behavior, right? Uh, and not become diabetic. Well, imagine now seeing a future self of yourself, right? Where we actually show you using your own medical data, right, and all the biomedical data that we know, this is what would happen to you three months from now, a year from now, five years from now, ten years from now. And the question is, now imagine that you're seeing yourself without a limb, blind, right, hooked up to a dialysis machine. Is that enough of a shock to really make someone comply, right, and where, when you have an opportunity to change your, your life and lifestyle and behavior? What could someone expect to see at an IST lab? Oh, at an ISD lab. All right. So you'll see uh, typically small, medium, or large interdisciplinary uh, research teams, right? So psychology, com psychologists, computer scientists, engineers, and all the stakeholders working together. And that stakeholders, we always think of adults, but that includes also K-12. So, so children are also involved because we want them to be actively participating in design of future technologies. We will see a lot of technology, different types of technology. And I'll show you some of the ones that, for example, we use to collect uh, live human data. So for example, your facial expressions of emotions, your eye tracking data, your physiology, et cetera. And then also a lot of new technologies. So whether it's a game environment, a simulation environment, extended reality, we'll have high fidelity mannequins where we practice, well, not we, but we collaborate with uh, clinical clinicians where we practice, for example, end of life scenarios. How do you teach a team to basically deal with death, right? Especially, for example, if you're gonna go into specialties as a emergency medicine or IC where you are dealing with, with death. So how do you prepare them for that? So yeah, so you can see some uh, interesting human and non-human artificial agents running around also in an ISD. What suggestions do you have for students aspiring to be part of the IST? That is a, a, a great question. We, for, for students to become part of IST, they can start off as, um, if they're in middle school and high school, right? Part of that is the building the STEM pipeline. So we're actually working on that in terms of a Department of Education um, grant that we just received a year ago. So the question is getting them excited, bringing them in in terms of internships, seeing, visiting the labs, talking to the researchers. Uh, and then of course, if they're undergrad students, the best thing that they can do is actually volunteer in the lab. So they get some research experience, they get to see what it's like to work in a science lab. They can also contribute scientifically to papers, to conference presentations, to the research, get those research skills. And that would prepare them for really any kind of STEM related uh, career, if they will, that touches on modeling and simulation. In what ways does the department get involved in the community? So part of uh, what we do here at IST in the School of Modeling and Simulation has to do with outreach. So whether it's, uh, for example, next week we actually have STEM Day. So we have 22 students from Osceola County from New York City Academy coming with their teachers where they're going to spend the whole day here. So they're going to get to use our technologies. They're going to give us feedback on the technologies that we are using. They are going to generate some new ideas of what things that we should also be looking at. So we also look for you know the youth to figure out what we should be doing. And this is really important in terms of, uh, especially having underrepresented minorities and women in STEM. This is an extremely important issue for us. So we have the community come to us, right, to participate, to give us, to so that we can hear their voice, share their voice. So for example, if you're developing a new avatar for one of our game-based learning environments, and for example, for targeting Hispanic students, right? The question is, should those avatars, for example, embody some of their ethnic, linguistic, you know, economic, any of those issues that are pertinent uh, to them, right? So that they are participatory design. And then the other thing is also where also we go to the community. And so whether it's, for example, spending time at different schools, uh, hospital clinics, hospital settings, military settings where we take our research and uh, not only for testing and implementation but also uh, once again to share w our findings with the community. Are there other opportunities for community engagement such as volunteering? 
Absolutely, absolutely. Yes, we have a lot of volunteers that come in uh, that go beyond the borders of UCF. For example, if you think about our undergraduate population, we have adults who like to volunteer. So for example, uh, when we've looked at uh, cancer patients that want to come and volunteer their time, right? And it could be something as simple as, oh, you're developing a new environment. So, you know, we would love to have an avatar that represents you. So for example, let's say a 50 year old female. So the question is, what would that avatar look like, right? Because we don't want to have them use an avatar that perhaps is an 18 year old. Teachers also can volunteer. Um, and then we also have, of course, we would love and we really want is our K-12 students to volunteer. And not just middle school and high school, but we can get them as early as elementary school so they can see, you know, uh, what, what it's like um, to do the research that we do. Is there anything else you'd like to share with our viewers? We are trying to grow our school of modeling and simulation, right? To uh, we're one of the leading schools of, of modeling, simulation, and training in the nation. And the question is that we're always looking to see how we can engage more students, how we can recruit more students, uh, and whether they want to become scientists, you know, or work in the field, work in the, the various industries that we're so fortunate to have here in Orlando. Right, we, uh, we're very uh, fortunate geographically to have so many opportunities and to have such a you know, multi-ethnic uh, corridor, if you will. And so there's so much work that can be used and, and gained and so many societal challenges that we still need to address that we're just you know, touching the tip of the iceberg. If you're enjoying this show, please subscribe to our channel and follow our Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter accounts.